Well, hey there, and uh, welcome to 1027. I'm Pastor Joe Meyer, Senior Pastor, Lead Pastor of Gloria Day Lutheran Church in Urbandale, Iowa. Thankful that you're joining us again today, and uh, it's a fantastic day to be alive and to give glory and honor to God and uh, all that He has done for us in Jesus, both His life, His well, both, I should say, all the things that Christ did for us, His life living for us on this earth, uh, living a perfect life for us, uh, his death that atoned or paid for the sins of the world and my personal sins, of course, uh, and then his resurrection for the uh, justification or to uh, all justification means is to make right, uh, to make right in the sight of God. And so we're thankful for everything that God does for us. It's a beautiful day here in Iowa and so uh, thankful to God, not just for salvation in Jesus' name, but also uh, for the life uh, the uh, breath in our lungs, uh, as some of the uh, older guys will say when I ask them how they're doing, they'll say to me, well, pastor, I'm upright and taking nourishment. Uh, and I say a hearty amen to that because life is, in fact, a gift from God. And I, I bring that to you this morning because, man, there's been a lot of stuff uh, around surrounding uh, the issue of life and death uh, in our world uh, recently. I just came across my desk the other day. I shared this in a sermon recently that uh, statistically the demographic that has the highest rate of suicide is not what most people think. Uh, most people think that the highest rate of suicide is among teenagers because that gets the, the most press, of course, uh, but it's not. It's actually 45 to 64 year olds. And as far as I can tell from what I've read, it's uh, because they feel a sense of despair uh, for the future, a sense of uh, foreboding when it comes to retirement and things like that. Uh, what, what, what is the economy going to look like you know, when they're retiring kind of thing? Uh, then the, it's followed by 85 and above, and I have a feeling, I, don't, I haven't substantiated this, but I have a feeling uh, those are assisted suicides where they feel like I have nothing more to live for, I hurt, I can't see anymore. Uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, they, they just feel purposeless. Their spouse of 60 plus years is now gone. And so they feel the need to take their lives uh, or have someone help them do so. And then, of course, it's followed by teenagers. And often teenagers, it's a, a bullying situation via the Internet, uh, a bullying situation via social media. Uh, and uh, often it's just, again, a, a similar thing, a sense of purposelessness. Uh, in their lives. So, so that came across my desk. And then uh, just this uh, past week, uh, the Iowa legislature uh, decided to pass a heartbeat, uh, fetal heartbeat bill uh, that will uh, require doctors after a heartbeat is detected, uh, re require them not, or to, let me say it differently, to refuse abortion to someone who, who requests abortion after a heartbeat is detected. What a marvelous marvelous law that is and and presumptively our governor who is pro-life will sign that into into law uh, so it you know it just brings up the the question why are christians so uh pro-life and, and i'm going to say it if you're a christian and you're listening to this pro-choice is not a box you get to check all right it's not it, it, let me let, let me just put it to you this way it is not a political issue um, uh, abortion, euthanasia, suicide, these are not political issues. They are, in fact, theological issues. And uh, theological just simply means the study of God. And so the Bible then dictates how we look at those things. And the Bible would say that God is, in fact, pro-life. What I mean by that, what I mean to say by that, is that God gives us his life. Uh, uh, um, well, he does give us his life. Uh, but he gives us our life, uh, and as a result of that, he alone is the one who decides who lives and dies, not us, all right? Uh, and so let me just take you to probably the most famous uh, set of verses on that very subject. It's Psalm 139, verses 13 and following, and it says this, You formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Notice what the psalmist is saying. In this case, it's David. Uh, but the psalmist is saying that God, in fact, is the one that made us. Your mom and dad didn't decide to have kids, but God decided that they would 
have children. And I know that's hard for people, but it's true. God knits us together in our mother's womb. And then David goes on to say this. It's a wonderful uh, phrase. It says this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. My body, in other words, was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, referring again to mom's womb. Uh, Your eyes saw my unformed substance and listen to this. This is the kicker. And in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet one of them, excuse me, there was, ah, didn't do that very well. Uh, The days were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, God has a set of days ordained for us to live, and it is not ours to decide when that day is going to end. God gives us our life, and God alone can take away our life. Now, it's not like God is ambivalent to our suffering. It's not as if God is ambivalent to the fact that when you're a teenager, you feel bullied and feel uh, feel like trash and feel like uh, lesser than other people. It's not as if God is ambivalent to the fact that when you're 45 to 64, you don't see hope for the future or or um, that, that you wonder about what's coming your way and you're afraid of that. It's not like God is somehow ambivalent to that. Uh, when you're 85 and older, it's not like God is ambivalent to the fact that, that you're blind and that you struggle and it hurts to get out of bed and all those things. God knows all those things. In fact, Jesus said in, in John 16, uh, 33, some, some of the most famous ver, uh, uh, verbiage or the famous words of Jesus Christ uh, from John 16, 33, Jesus says it this way, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. All right. So Jesus is telling us we're going to have tribulation. In fact, the word here is very strong. It's the same word that's used for what we call the great tribulation at the end of time. In this world, Jesus promises you will have tribulation. And all of that, don't forget, Christian, all of that tribulation is our fault. It's not God's fault. Everything that happens in our world is a result, uh, negative stuff, of course, is a result of sin that we brought into the world when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. They infected our world. They brought an infection that brings sickness and heartache and pain and difficulty and a sense of uh, of hopelessness to us. All of that was brought on by us, not God. And yet notice what Jesus says. Take heart, I have overcome the world. So as we live, we live in two ways. One, recognizing that God is the giver of our life. And if it's if it's God's life, and l- let me just remind you that, that in fact it is God's life, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 says that very thing. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul says it this way. You are not your own. We could just stop there. You're God's. You are not your own. But then he, he completes it. For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. As a Christian, he purchased you. He owns you. He's got the deed. But we could just back off the Christian thing. Even if you're a Muslim today, he owns you. He created you, you see. He owns the deed. You are his property, all right? But second of all, let me just take you back to what Jesus said in John 16, 33. Remember what he says, that in me you may have peace. And and he says, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. As a Christian, we value life because God gives it. But as a Christian, we also value life Because God has spoken into the difficulties of our life with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He has given us hope. He has given us a future. He has given us a a way of looking at life that is different, that we know that at the end of our days, when God has ordained it, we will die, and yet shall we live. In fact, I mentioned in a sermon recently about a crossing over point where people are one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat. They're one foot in this world and one foot in the other. And what do we know every time from those stories, true or not, we're just going to guess that they're true, 
is that God is just transitioning for, for us from this life to the next. That's our merciful Heavenly Father. My encouragement to you today is celebrate your life. Go to God with your difficulties. He wants to help you. That's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Look it up. But understand that he wants you to live until that day that he calls you home to your real life on the other side. I hope that helps you. In Jesus' name.